Hi, welcome to FPAC. I'm Mark Schaefer uh, with Keith Dimmitt here. We're members of the uh, Carnegie Historical Museum Board. Today is March 10th, 2002, I believe. Mm -hmm. And we're here to do a, a program on Parsons College sports. And it's going to be sort of a catch-as-catch-can sort of a deal. Uh, the content of the program was contingent on what we found in terms of artifacts in the museum storage boxes, which was kind of fun going through all that. Uh, there were a number of things that we were pleasantly surprised by. And uh, we also have a few people that are going to come on camera that uh, were active in the 40s and then late 60s up till the end of uh, the Parsons era. So with that, I think, Keith, will you help me here? We're going to uh, do a little show and tell. If you'd take this 1929 Pyra, mm -hmm. I hope I'm saying that right. And I'm not sure if how the how this will show on camera. Can the cameraman zoom in on, on, on this? We have this page of the 1929 Pyra showing the college band and the college orchestra. And the college band notation says, uh, the band with its new uniforms pepped many a football game and created enthusiasm for other activities. The band gave an excellent concert in Bar Height Chapel on April 26th, that would be 1929. And uh, I guess I picked up on this because Isla Lou was in the, uh, in the band and he played, what did he play? Oh, rats. Yep, he was the alto saxophone. So that's Isla. And this is Ben, ben Taylor's pie, right? And, and Ben's signature is in the alley, or whatever you call that, the gutter, or whatever you call that in the book. Yeah, right there. All through this book, Ben has his autograph. And he, I thought, oh, he was in the band. Well, he's, he wasn't in the band. So I don't know why he practiced his name so many times. He was like me when I was that age. You know, I was trying to make a really nice signature. So I'll, I'll just bet you that's what he was doing. <laughs> practice, practice. Yeah, don't bump the yeah. microphone there. There you go. Now, with this picture, we have um, this is Coach Glenn uh, Glenn Devine, and it appears that he was a football coach, and I don't know, Frankie, basketball. and basketball the track. The so he was. It was a one-man show as far as yes. the men's uh, sports department. I got this from him. Okay, that was Frankie Beatty sharing, and she'll share a little bit more later. But he was the football uh, and basketball he coach. For oh, and he played football for Iowa. All right. Well, this is 19, and a brother that played football. All right. We're getting uh, comments from the audience here. So anyway, the reason I wanted to show this in particular was that the library is very lucky to have a drawing by Ben Taylor. You can set that down for a minute, Keith. If you would tip up that picture. And I don't is, now, cameraman, is that OK? There's no glare? This is a drawing by um, Ben Taylor and one of his female classmates, and I can't remember her name, but it doesn't matter because I'll look at it in a minute here. But this is called Freeze of the Prophets, and he, uh, probably a pun here, Freeze is F-R-E-E-Z-E -E -E instead of F-R-I-E-Z-E. -E. And it says, with apologies to Sargent, and I don't know if, if John Singer Sargent maybe did a painting called The Freeze of the Prophets. I'm going to have to find out, because I'll bet you anything this is sort of a spoof on that. But the reason we're showing this is because the coach in question, uh, Coach Devine, is pictured right here with his Marcel, uh, looks like Marcel hairdo and his widow's peak. Which one? Is it? Right, right there. So you can, uh, sure. And then after the program, anybody that's up here can certainly look at these a little more closely. Oh, yes, yeah, sure. Oh, I see, with the widow's peak. Yeah. You can see. It's kind of fragile in back yeah. there, isn't it? But we're real tickled to have this. This, this was found in uh, Ben Taylor's effects when he passed away, and uh, Martha Flintspaugh, the executor of his estate, was good enough to donate that to that to the museum, so we're appreciative of that. And then here we have a picture of the Booster Club. Many of you remember John Hunt. And uh, this is John Hunt with lots of hair. It's not the John Hunt I remember, but dark and curly. And um, he was the business manager. So that, that must have gotten him started. Who knows? Wasn't he Fairfield Glove? Okay. 
And then at the bottom are some, uh, looks like they had cheerleaders, and they're all men. So were there cheerleaders, female cheerleaders, like in the 30s, or? I think there was a man. Were they? Bill Gates. Okay, so th so these pages, I've we've lost the page numbers, but these are written on these bookmarks, so you can check those out later if you want to. And here we have a men's letter club and the PC club, which is the women's uh, group. And according to this, it says the girl who has earned 100 points in women's athletics may become a member of the PC club. Uh, it's an organization to boost girls' athletics and to promote that old Parsons spirit. Now, Parsons wasn't that old in the 20s, but I, I guess that's, that's okay. Uh, women's, let's see, it was, at this time it was women, women's tennis and volleyball and basketball, I think, were the three women's sports. At least that's what I found in the book there. So that's uh, sports in the 20s. And then we have one other little artifact here. Keith, if you want to hold this up. It's uh, this Which little uh, yeah, encapsulated mm -hmm. piece. And then I'll take the thank you note. Yeah, I'll take this. This is a, you want to hold the ticket up for the camera? This is uh, Carthage versus Parsons football, Friday, October 20th, 1922. Uh, it cost you 50 cents to get in. And this was a letter written to Mrs. Sells. Uh, by Kay, Ro uh, Kay Royer. She says, I appreciate you having the picture and football ticket put in the Parsons Museum. I'm assuming my father had a ticket to, the, to this game and attended the game. My mother and I uh, are assuming he went home to Bloomfield for the weekend. Whatever that means. Anyway, my mother could never believe her ticket would find a home in, a, in the Parsons Museum. So it's nice to have these little, these are the kinds of things that we appreciate as donations to the museum. And this, this uh, gift also included a panoramic vo photo of the entire Parsons student body back in 1922, or 23 maybe. And those are, that's always fun to look at. Okay, Keith, you have, you're, gonna, you're here yeah, in proxy I've, for somebody. Yeah, right. <laughs> I uh, was fortunate enough to meet the uh, legendary uh, Bud Cochran, uh, or Dick Cochran. Uh, who was just before we set up uh, to to uh, assemble here? He and his son were in the car, and uh, uh, he was going to come up. But being 91, he didn't exactly uh, think he had it in him today. So he was uh, uh, he his father or his son asked me to uh, do a short interview with him. So I got a, a few notes. Right. You want to hold, and, let me hold up that picture yeah. while you're uh, sharing your notes. Football prepared Co Cochran for the game of life. So here's yeah. here's a picture of him. Uh, the caption underneath. Yeah, the, uh, it says, local legend Dick Cochran made a name for himself as a football player for Fairfield High School and later for the University of Iowa and Parsons College. He says his love for football pales in comparison to his love of family. He says, my family, they are everything. That's nice. Yeah. So anyway, here's, Stacey I'll hold this. Uh, that article. Yeah, this is an article by Stacy Richmond. I remember Lou Blinken said he was the first All-State man he ever coached at Fairfield High School. That's right. So, he, he left that little uh, bit of uh, okay, notation so, for me. Great. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, he graduated from Parsons in 34. Uh, went to the University of Iowa from 30 to 31. Uh, and probably, well, yeah, 30, 31, and then 32 and 33, and into 34, he was at, at uh, Parsons, and in, into the football. Uh, and in case you couldn't hear Mr. Aarons from the audience, would you repeat that information about Luke Lincoln coaching yeah, Cochran? Right, and also, uh, uh, it, it says Lewis Glinklin, is that how you Glinkin. say it? Yeah, Glinkin, yeah. yeah. And he was, he was coached, uh, uh, by him, and uh, he was the, the, he said that he, well, they, they uh, he was the all-star, first all-star in, in uh, Fairfield High School. And, uh, and the first and, one. And the first one ever. The first and, one that Lincoln ever yeah, coached. All right, yeah, right. yeah, that's great. And uh, so, pretty neat. He was also a basketball uh, star here, too, in, in the uh, Fairfield area. And, uh, he was, see we have uh, Mr. Devine, Glenn Devine was uh, 
his coach, and he, he did some assistant work with uh, Audrey uh, Devine, the football, football assistant. So anyway, we we're going to get some more information from him. I think my wife and I are going to go out and interview him. Oh, how fun. Do a, oh, that's do a great. tape recording, you know. And, That'd and, be great. And he, his father was uh, really encouraging that. So oh, that's I neat. think there's someone else that's doing that, too, in the uh, community that's getting some things recorded. Maybe FPAC would like to accompany the Dimmits when they do the interview. We can do that. They yes, like Mr. That. Aarons. Uh, I can remember football players playing for Luke Lincoln. And uh, if you'd ask him, well, uh, how, how is it playing for Luke? He said, well, you're bound to be good because uh, if you're going to play for Luke, you're going to be tough. And he'd say, I don't want to see those tackles. I want to hear them. <laughs> oh my, he wants, Lincoln wanted to hear the tackles. That's great. So I Lincoln probably lift this up and there you go. Well, we'll get, yeah. I'll tell you what, Mr. Aaron's comments are welcome and I think we're going to uh, shut off the camera for a minute and get some more people up here. Okay, we're back and uh, on my immediate right here we have Vera Young who was uh, women's physical education and coached basketball I believe. Would, would you care to share a little bit about your career at Parsons? Well, uh, <coughs> they wanted to have a women's basketball team, and actually Paul Sells uh, did it for a while, and then I kind of inherited it. Um, Tib came to Parsons in 1946, which was the year that I graduated, and then I taught away 1947. When I came back in 1948, I got the girls' basketball team, as well as It sounds like teaching. you got the guy, too. <laughs> yeah, I did, besides teaching um, women's physical education. And of course, I wanted to say just a moment, something about Tib. He had all the sports, football, baseball, basketball, and track. He had them all. You know, he didn't have any assistant coaches at all uh, for some time. And um, so, I don't know how successful we were, but we did it. So it was a lot of fun. So we weren't too bad. I played for him. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, I was there at Parsons for the next 25 years. Sure, sure. So, so you, you saw it all. Yeah, right. And next we have Norval Evans. When, what, when was your career at Parsons? Uh, <clears throat> just prior to World War II and during World War II. I, I came in 39. A couple of boys in my hometown that came, had come up the year before, Harper and Gross, and we had uh, Frosty Swingles. He was our leader. He, he could do about anything. He even taught us how to earn our own shirts. <laughs> <laughs> Your quarterback was Stinky Pugh. Pugh, was, he was kind of a second rate. Uh, uh, Ray Tennant was a, was a quarterback for one year, and then remember he, got, he left once in our service. Then Pugh, and then uh, uh, Walt Dabner, Fairfield boy, uh, Dale Gillespie, a Fairfield boy, Phil Wilson, he was one of the Fairfield boys, got drafted, so that left everybody in a pickle. So they, they pieced out a team in 40, <coughs> 43, most of them left in 42. 43 we were all in then, and, uh, for the duration, plus six months. So Parsons, I think, did they ever get on to eight-man football or six-man football no, or something? I don't think so. They didn't have much going. Do you remember Ms. Sells? No, I don't. Yeah, they, they went to eight-man football. I know when well, Tim first came. Uh, well, tell us some more about Iowa Conference when you were... Well, the Iowa Conference was a... was a, <laughs> They had uh, Loris at Davenport, which then was Columbia. Then they changed it to Loris. And then Dubuque, Iowa Westland, uh, Central at Pella, William Penn, Wartburg, I think, was one of the schools up north was in it. Buena Vista might have been in it. And it was the old Iowa schools. I remember in this year, your Iowa felt weather in 39. We played on the 19th of September. It was just boiling hot, all those uniforms on, and it just wore you down. Then that fall, Iowa, uh, Parsons always played in Mount Pleasant on Thanksgiving Day. 
they went over Thanksgiving Day to Mount Pleasant and it snowed about that much and they raked the snow off and put the lines on with stoker coal. <laughs> So that's the way we played football. So you had black lines on a white field. Black, <laughs> black and white. But those those boys, Ray Tennant and, and Swingles and Kincaid and Gross, Harper and I, we all lived up in a, in a gym. And Ray Tennant lived there for a year. Bill Amling lived there for a year. Fro came up here from a school in Missouri, I think, uh, uh, southeastern, not Cape Girard, I believe, where we picked up Swingles. He picked up Hamling and uh, University of Missouri. His brother coached at Missouri, Don Fro. These boys weren't good enough or big enough for Missouri, so he brought them up here and uh, got them a scholarship. And back those days, you got a scholarship and a job, and, and it, it's mind-boggling what my granddaughter had to pay to go to college for four years today. So, what we paid for four years of college back then, so. Haven't you got an OB story you can tell? Pardon? Haven't you got an O.B. Nelson story you can tell? No. Uh, O.B. O.B. He's a he's a memorable. He, everybody else has a story on O.B. Yeah. O.B. He uh, he came from Batavia. They didn't play football there, but he learned how to put a uniform on, and then he, from then on he took off pretty good. But he 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 didn't graduate from Parsons. He graduated from Grinnell, and the reason wasn't because he wasn't he was smart as a whip. But he wouldn't go to ch chapel, so they gave him a demerit for every for day he missed. He couldn't graduate, so he, after the war was over, he went up to Grill and finished up the last semester and graduated up there. <laughs> well, he coached there at Grinnell. Pardon? Uh, Ob coached at Grinnell. Did he? Yeah, for a year. He, or so, he got a he? job coaching at uh, the high school. Yeah. And he wasn't very, really very successful in football, but come along. <clears throat> I don't know what year that had been, but it come along, uh, the uh, basketball coach for Grinnell College got sick, and they asked O.B. to come up and coach a basketball team. So he did, and he was very successful. <laughs> and, uh, oh, they had lots of fun. And I'm sure that's probably why O.B. got to come back here. He was successful at Grinnell mm -hmm. uh, College of he tried to He tried to get in at Fort Dodge. Forrest Parkey was assistant well, that coach here. That could have been. And, and Forrest didn't think he was good enough for a big school like Fort, Fort Dodge. Yeah. <laughs> he probably would have put Fort Dodge on the map. <laughs> he, Forrest wouldn't give him the job. Forrest was the athletic director up there then. Well, in 48, I think it was 48. I wouldn't be surprised. O.B. had come to yeah, Parsons. That's, I would be my guest. Too. And he, like I said, he said to me, we don't really need too good a player. We need bodies. <laughs> so he asked, <laughs> asked me. <laughs> so anyway, we had, I think we won the Iowa Conference three years in a row. Mrs. Sellis maybe helped me. Uh, we had Bud Backus, Paul Strathman. We had... Uh, uh, who? Jerome. No, Bill. No, Bill, Bill oh, he played football. Uh, uh, Bill yeah, the guy who went to uh, Tumwa and uh, was a superintendent. Dick Geith and Merle Rosterman. Yes. That was the first five. And Targ Lindsay. Then came me, and then we had a pony team. Yes, that's We had little Ivan Hilton and C.E. Allison and maybe Bill Jerome. When things weren't going good, O.B. would run those guys in and they'd set you nuts. <laughs> and that, that little Ivan Hilton, what, one night he made nine, seven in a row from the corner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, it was fun. Was Jack Sapp your center for that group? No, Kester. Who? Kester. Kester, Kester came oh, next. Nice. Chester came next with. Uh, but with that Pony Express with Jack Sapp? The no, no. Jack played with us, but uh, uh, Tar Lindsay was the center. For the tall guys? Yeah. Well, I was the darn center for the little guys. <laughs> <laughs> then you played football. Well, I didn't play enough football. I broke my arm and I said, I was 26 years old and I said, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> you went to Drake. Oh. You went to the relays. What part oh, of yeah. Oh, gosh, our track team was good. <clears throat> uh, 
we we got we got second in the 440 in the 880 yard relay. Grinnell beat us. I run anchor. The guy that run anchor for Grinnell was my neighbor of mine. I, well, I come from Grinnell. And uh, John Bagnata. And uh, John was fast. Man, he was fast. And I stood there and I said, John, I'm going to just gobble you right up. They better bring that in ahead head of uh, my man. Well, John could have just run off and left me in the dust. <laughs> he was that good. But we got second in both those relays, 440 and 88. That's about all I can tell you. Well, I, I want to make sure I mention this. The uh, framed picture in front of Mr. Evans there is, I think, the 1962 Iowa Conference track uh, team photo with Luke Lincoln standing in the background. And this plush doll, that probably predates you, or you guys probably predate that little football doll here, don't you? This little, <coughs> right in front. Is that, is that more like from the 60s? Well, that, that might have been you guys. Was it, not even, did you have what, some stuff what? like that? Roy, I, I don't recall. Well, it looks more like the 60s, but I want to make sure, just, just, just to be positive. Uh, does anybody know anything about this old stadium pillow? It's kind of crumbly and it's the old rose and green lettering. <clears throat> but it didn't have a date on it upstairs and uh, I just wondered if anybody in the audience knew about that. I'm guessing it's at least 1920s, maybe older. Yeah. Well, anything... We didn't have anything like that. It didn't even have a stadium, really. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, where, was the, where was the field? We played on the, trust, on the field out there. Part of the time, a high school part of the time, a okay. Tomah part of the time. Oh, in a Tomah? Oh, okay. We played Simpson, I remember, we were Tomah. Yeah, by the field house. There was a field. I mean, before they put the field Okay, so we're trusty the field gym, house is now. We're the gym, the field house. Okay, there. all right. And the dumb field ran uphill, believe it or not. It was, <laughs> must have been a foot or so lower this side than <laughs> that side. So if you got the toss, you always try to pick the, the way. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that funny? Well, is there anything else you y'all want to add? No, except World War II. We want a f only a faint recollection of that. <laughs> you were busy. Well, thank you. Thank you, one and all. Okay, this is Frankie Beatty, and she has some stories to tell. So, <laughs> uh, anyway, most, put on your seatbelts, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> most everyone has an O.B. Nelson story to tell. Uh, what, two of my favorites are one of them when he was starting coaching at Parsons and uh, talking about the team. He says, "We're small, but we're slow." <laughs> <laughs> and my first introduction was very to OB was very informal. I was having my lunch at the jail cafe and in that summer a lot of those football uh, stars were working at the Malibu for two reasons. One of them to keep in shape and the other one was to make a little money. But they ate at the jail cafe at noon and he came by me as I was eating. He ran his fingers through my mashed potatoes, took a taste and said, mashed potatoes don't have so many lumps today. And that's just the kind of guy he was. <laughs> and you'd never seen him before? No, I didn't know who he was. <laughs> no, yeah, that's pretty gross. <laughs> I thought it was. And their hands, I don't think they'd wash their hands either from walking at the Malibu. Oh, he'd been at the Malibu. Oh, my gosh. I think that yeah. was where they worked. Wasn't that right in the summertime that they worked at the Malibu? So now, where was the jail cafe? And the jail cafe was where the yellow submarine was in latter years. Uh, out in New Chicago. Okay. And they called it the Jail Cafe because uh, Dutch Wolof had come back from California with a lot of ideas for for new uh, entrepreneurship, and they had the uh, they had the bars and everything to look like a jail. So he actually he just made it look like a jail. Yes, just... made some windows and that sort of thing. That's why it was called the Jail Cafe. Oh, that's pretty funny. You know what, Frankie? Can you reach the book that has the or maybe Keith? Will you lift up the one that has Obi's picture in it? Yeah, what was O.B.? What was his name? Oscar, Oscar Bernard. Oscar Bernard. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, right. So if the camera, can we focus in on O.B.'s picture there? Is that a good angle? Real, real muscular guy. Got it? Okay. And then one other thing I wanted to tell you about is uh, the old timers will appreciate this. There are, the, we found some, uh, it was fun finding these pennants and banners and stuff. And there, the 
fraternities were the Zetas and the AKs, Alpha Kappa Chi. And then the uh, sororities were Elsevier and Empyrean. Well, it was kind of political, but the Empyreans sort of aligned themselves with the Zetas, uh, I mean with the AKs, and the Elseviers with the Zetas. Well, when Frosty Schwingles uh, came to Parsons, Betty Schwingles was going with Don Johnson, no, excuse me, Bob Johnson, was going with Bob Johnson, but uh, she changed over to Frosty Schwingles, and the, since Bob Johnson was a Zeta, and she had started going with him. They blackballed her from the rest of the, they didn't invite her to any more of the parties because she had thrown over uh, Zeta for, an, uh, for, she had thrown over the AK for a Zeta. I just can't imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> it was lots of fun. It was lots of fun. And that, is that green skirt some, uh, back, in the 47 when the new look came in and the longer, was that a, and they had girl cheerleaders then, is that a cheerleader skirt? No, <laughs> well, anyway, uh, it's whenever the skirts were long because it's kind of a long skirt. Well, that was 47 when the new look came in. Yes, so I thought that was <coughs> And these old pennants that we thought was fun showing the colors, it used to be the rose and green and then the green and white. Thank you, Frankie. Talking about Obi Nelson, uh, I, Obi said okay. he didn't know that Chuck Ferguson. Okay. Oh, Chuck Ferguson. Okay. Yeah. So Obi said he didn't know that Chuck Ferguson played on his team after right. a brilliant play. Okay. Is the camera off? I don't know. Is the camera off? Okay, we're back again. Um, I have Dan Breen here on my right, and Sue Carr. What? Who were you before you became Sue Carr? Bird. Sue Bird. Bird. Sue Bird. You were a softball player, mm -hmm. and Dan was a basketball player, and Bill Moore, football. Am I right? That's correct. Now, did y'all do other sports too? No. Okay. I played a little basketball. Little basketball. Um, so, who? Late? Should we do ladies first? <laughs> sure. All right. Let me get the microphone over here a little bit closer. All right. So, tell us how you came to Parsons when you were there, and. Well. Um, as a high school senior, I didn't know where I wanted to go to college, and I was offered a softball scholarship here at Parsons, and because I only got to play one year in high school, because we had just started sports, and I pretty much jumped at the chance to be able to um, attend college and play some sports while I was at it. And most of the memorabilia I have is just pictures that uh, a freshman would take her first year of college. Of course, um, all the all the neat things of the campus when you first come, and um, my letter of acceptance, and more campus. And I guess the highlight of our last year was kind of the culmination of Parsons Athletics, and and because after the college closed, we continued to stay together as a softball team, and most of the players stayed, and Ethan Town, the coach, stayed and entered ourselves in the uh, competition for the, for the state softball tournament, which we ended up winning, and that was really a wonderful experience, and it was a really emotional year, time. Oh, well, really? What year, 1970? 73. 73. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was a, a nice way to you know, tie up a sad situation. Yeah, it really was. We had oh, so, such wonderful support with the mm -hmm. town, mm -hmm. and of course, it was a real emotional time anyway, and, and we, it was held in Fairfield, the state softball tournament, which was even more special. Mm -hmm. And um, we lost our second game, and so we had to come back from the loser's bracket and win six in a row, which we did, and uh, so wow. that was really exciting, yeah. And then Joyce Whitzenberg would have been on that team also? Yeah, she actually wasn't going to college at the time, but she came and played with us that summer because it wasn't officially a okay. college team anymore, okay, sure. so we had a few people that came. So, and Joyce's that. maiden name was, do you remember? Joyce Berlin. Joyce Berlin. Yeah, Joyce was going to be here today, but then her daughter is playing uh, college sports mm -hmm. and she's in Florida. Mm -hmm. She's probably on her way back by now, but she went to Florida to, to see Penny play. And she, naturally I left it at work. She gave me a nice letter. Oh kind of doing some of the second generation mm -hmm. um, connections like the children of women on the on this mm -hmm. team that are now playing each other intercollegiately mm -hmm. and yeah um, my daughter played somebody who I'd played with at Parsons okay the Wick twins I'd played with them and 
basketball and so she played they played against your, each other oh that's neat that's neat mm -hmm. So it's not, and you had a reunion sometime back? Yeah, it was last um, fall, but I didn't get to go because I was watching my son play okay. football in college. So. Well, in Joyce's letter, there was something about not big wheel pizza or something about pizza. La Pizza House. Oh, La Pizza was, House. All right. After after that summer that we were here, um, many of the softball players for the next two or three years went to Des Moines and played as a team and got new sponsors there and and live there and work there um, for a summer job, which was really fun for us because especially me, only being there that first, that last year, you don't really get to know a lot of the people very well. And after those summers, we spent in Des Moines together. They came, we came back from colleges that we had gone to as we spread out and then were able to be together in the summertime to play some more softball. Now, were you actually recruited or did you apply? Well, my coach kind of did the, between he and Jack North, who was a wonderful supporter of, of women's softball, and um, they, I, I actually never visited Parsons, so it was kind of a traumatic move for me to come here, a long ways away from northern Iowa at that time. And he just sent my statistics to Ethan Town, the coach, and then they offered me the scholarship. Great. Well, thank you very much. I also want to show these oh, yeah. interesting little well, she has some artifacts things here. that I can't wear anymore. <laughs> <laughs> this is a letter jacket that I never got to wear because, of course, I didn't get it until spring, and so it was a little too warm then. And these are some of these things we just kind of inherited because we were the end, and so before they went off to auction, we were able to, because we worked for the college last summer, and these were basketball warm-ups. And then these are the cute little uh, softball uniforms. Oh, show the back. We've got to see that Sorry, wild. Yes. Those <laughs> wild kittens. <laughs> Go wild kittens. We have a couple of those. And then this was a, a base, actually a baseball jersey. We just kind of confiscated some of those things from that last summer. Well, it's nice to see those. I want to have one more really nice trophy that, you know, a lot of college kids might broken bad, but this is the last trophy that we each got as Iowa champions for the softball team. And a couple Great. of buttons. Great. Well, thank you, Sue. Mm -hmm. Well, now it's Dan Breen's turn. So how did you come to Parsons? Well, I, unlike a, a lot of people's experience, I think Excuse in, me, let me in Parsons Pass, uh, there we go. I'm, I guess, after all these years, I don't know if I can still be a carpetbagger or not. I, I came in from uh, Ohio. I really didn't even know where Parsons College was when I, there was some contact. I was a junior college basketball player, and a, uh, my coach had, had had connections in Iowa. So in in the recruiting process of different colleges I had talked to and coaches, uh, one of them was Parsons College, uh, and uh, uh, it was a I think a little bit like Sue, they, they were anxious to give me a scholarship right off the bat and uh, a full scholarship. So I immediately became really interested because uh, uh, I wasn't sure at that point whether how many of those offers I would have. Uh, I didn't know really anything about it. I, I think in the East, you know, we had all the, the, the reputation of Parsons from Look Magazine or whatever, but I was never really too much aware of that and, and it never really even bothered me when some people talked about some problems uh, academically or whatever. Are you saying you fit right in? Well, no. <laughs> well, in, in, a sense, in a sense, I did. Uh, in that uh, uh, I can honestly say that academically, I just wasn't that interested in high school and, and junior college. I did pretty well, but I was never really a real student as I look back. I just was getting by. Uh, basketball was my passion. and. Uh, uh, the, what really attracted me was that, well, Bob Griggis was our coach, and he was really quite the salesman, uh, quite honestly. He, he really could, uh, t could talk a good game. He was a good coach and a wonderful guy, but he was, he was quite a salesman. And he just really convinced me that this would be a, a great place to play. He was uh, taking the program nationally as he had it, and we, were, we had players coming in from essentially all over the country. We were going to play all over the country, and that was probably the thing that sold me most of all things to say why I came here. We were going to be playing to ball, 
uh, excuse me, <clears throat> to Paul in Chicago and Murray State in the South, and uh, we we're going to uh, the Portland. We played uh, Portland University and Portland State. We played Montana, uh, uh, Gonzaga, which is now more known nationally for its basketball program. So it was a big Eastern Michigan, which was a little closer to home and so forth. So I was really impressed with the kind of schedule they were putting together. And he just convinced me this was a school that was wanting to commit itself to a, a big time basketball program. So the, the money was right and the opportunity looked good to me. Uh, and I signed even before I came out here and visited, which I probably shouldn't have done looking back. I probably should have waited and, and weighed the other offers. And, but he convinced me it was the thing to do. Uh, I, I signed and, and then I came out to visit uh, later. I'm not sure, it's, it's interesting, I thought about this after being asked to come on here, if I would have still come, if I had visited first, <laughs> because I was from the, the city, uh, I'm from Cleveland area, and uh, when, when we, I drove out here with, with one of my friends, I remember crossing the Mississippi and we got all excited because it hadn't occurred to us we'd be crossing the Mississippi River and I had never probably been more than 100 miles from home my whole life. And I was like, the Mississippi River, oh wow. And then we got to Southeast Iowa and I just had never really seen anything quite like that where the, the, I remember driving into Fairfield and it was just so small that it was a cultural shock. It, it, it seems funny to me now, but I just could not believe where I was and uh, went to the campus and the campus was very beautiful so that part I'd been told right and so forth. In fact it was sort of a strange thing now I'm thinking about it. I, I didn't know really where to find the coach Bob Griggis when I showed up and I was just supposed to be there for this weekend. So I went to the football uh, dorm where it wasn't really a dorm it was one of the quads I guess you'd say and I knocked on the door and the one person was there, I, just, I don't know where everybody else was, and it happened to be Art Walker. And if you remember <laughs> Art Walker, Art Walker was about six. six. Four, 315 pounds. Yeah, was, <laughs> he played nose guard and I had to block him. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, and fortunately he was very nice to me about, oh yes, okay, I'll help you find your coach. And, and that was my start, but uh, played a little bit that weekend with the guys that were already here. Um, and I decided that maybe this small town wouldn't be such a bad thing. But I'd already signed anyway, so I uh, went back home and just uh, uh, sort of committed myself to come out here. And it sounds a little uh, sappy, I guess, but it's, I've always told people it's the best thing that ever happened to me. Because it was somewhere in the course of me getting here really to be a basketball player, the, uh, the academic uh, side of Parsons very soon set in. I don't know what it was. I guess I was, had matured enough. And I had access to such tremendous uh, professors, professors in, in uh, uh, history is what was my major was. And I just got excited about it and, and I just became a different person. So academically and socially, uh, I'm one of those people that started out uh, on the rough edge of things, I guess you'd say, a sort of a street kid, and then came here and became a student, a real solid citizen, and I studied and, and tried to be a, a good leader and so forth. And you know, most kids, they live pretty good lives and then they go to college and they make a lot of mistakes. I made a lot of mistakes and then went to college and, and lived pretty straight and narrow for, for the years I was uh, played at Parsons and uh, I was always, uh, always have, uh, felt that it was probably the best decision I ever made even though I probably didn't do it for the right reasons to begin with. A couple of, couple of side notes, Dan always sat in front of the class, he always had A's and his two teams were both uh, top 20 division two in the nation when he played. Great. And it seems like you have a girls' basketball state championship under your belt, too, as I recall. Well, that, that, I, that's what I mean about being kind of a carpetbagger. I've always <laughs> taken advantage of the community there to uh, take, yeah. uh, in this case. Yeah. What, uh, year, what the, year did your high school team win the state? I can't remember. Uh, the girls won in 1983, okay, which is a long time ago is now, isn't it? <laughs> and then what, what years were you at Parsons? I was at Parsons from 69 to 71, because I, okay. I had graduated uh, from a junior college first. Okay. And, and, and okay. then came here and, and, and really finished my education uh, at, at Parsons. Guys you yeah, well, uh, to start with, uh, uh, Benny Robinson was uh, a real well-known player. Uh, Tim Dieters, who was my roommate, uh, yeah. and I talked to Tim just uh, the other day about this, uh, he was the one big Iowa recruit we had. Uh, Parsons really got lucky there in a sense because Tim was a big time player here. I mean, he was all state twice and, and or three times, one of the leading scorers all time. He was six, seven, you know, a big kid. 
but he just wasn't much of a student either. And I'm not sure he'd have gone to college at all. And Bob Griggis went and got him off a tractor. It sounds like, it just sounds funny, but he walked out right in the field while Tim was on the tractor and per persuaded him to come to Parsons. So Tim was, and then became the leading all-time scorer for Parsons. He played four years here and so forth. So uh, oh, we had guys from, from all over the place, uh, Sam Hamilton, uh, who was from Chicago, Illinois, and uh, Maurice Armstrong, who was also from Michigan, like uh, Benny was. We had Dominic Cicerello from uh, Syracuse, New York, and Jim Limbaugh from, from Pittsburgh. Uh, we had a couple of kids from Illinois uh, that didn't, weren't here very long, but Ed Stein and, and Phillips, and a kid from California by the name of Randy Hahn. Greg Diath from Indiana. Uh, well, yes, and the next year we come in, it's uh, Greg Diath, uh, who was from Indiana, another uh, junior college player and Red Lawson came from Tennessee and uh, we just the, the players it was really it, it uh, uh, Mr. Griggis or Coach Griggis really was honest about that we he went everywhere to find players Bill Carlisle became my coach the next year oh, yeah. and uh, we actually had a much we had a better team the second year uh, uh, Bob Griggis ran into uh, uh, one of those situations where it was sort of the wrong place in time where there was a lot of uh, uh, problems uh, racially and so forth at that time. That was sort of the uh, black power time and he got caught kind of in between on some of that and it was always very unfortunate. You know, it, I, I think he got in a bad situation as far as how the, uh, uh, although he had nothing to do with any kind of racial problems, uh, it, it was, didn't turn out to be the place for him to stay. And then Bill Carlisle came in and he was from the South and so forth and an excellent coach, went on Oklahoma State uh, and uh, did very well here for several years even after uh, you know, I, I graduated and, and helped them actually. The, we started the Parsons College Junior Drill Team. It was Bill Carlisle, myself, and Ben Robinson. Uh, that, that's, that seems like a long time ago too, but that, that, that was sort of a fun thing to do. That was sort of the beginning of my coaching career of all things. Uh, so what, uh, what was the drill team? It was just, it was sort of to promote the Parsons a little bit to get people in the community at the games and it was partly to promote the local basketball that uh, coming in from the outside we always felt like locally maybe they could could do more to probably play basketball better in the city you always had that attitude like the small towns uh, play wasn't maybe up to snuff uh, and uh, they'd gone through a couple of years not a lot of talent whatever so uh, it was just a bunch of little kids and we taught them to uh, uh, dribble between their legs and spin the ball on the finger and do all kinds of things that our coach would have never let us do anyway. But it was, and then you play Sweet Georgia Brown or something and all the parents clap and they, and they, they might uh, uh, make a basket or two and everybody would cheer. And, it, uh, and the kids had fun. It was a good experience for all of us. Uh, and uh, I, it was just coincidental. I don't think it had anything to do with it. But uh, it seemed like uh, 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 Fairfield entered a kind of a whole a couple of decades of, of a lot better athletics and so forth that had really good teams. Uh, and a lot of those kids went on. I, I was a high school coach and so forth. Got to see them go on and do well. So we, it was just a good experience, kind of a fun thing to do. I don't know how many, I, you probably had to be a parent to really remember or appreciate it, but uh, they, they got a, the kids had a, got a kick out of it. We had a great big turnout. Uh, that was, but that was entertainment more than it was anything else, just sort of get the kids started. Wasn't the highest ranking you guys 18th when you played? I don't know. I, I of course, Dave was in charge of all that. Dave Neff and whatever. I, uh, uh, you know what I was like, Bill. I, during the season, I just never even paid too much attention other than who was going to guard the next game or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> or whatever. I, uh, I'm like a lot of people. I probably didn't appreciate it enough at the time as far as just stopping and uh, uh, realizing what a great opportunity this was and how much fun I was having. And, uh, but I really, I, I, I really enjoyed my coaches and my teammates. I, I, was, I was very fortunate, had a lot of great guys. Uh, and, I, and that's one thing that sports does for people. Uh, you, you get to really know people you wouldn't otherwise, and you get committed to them in ways that you don't otherwise. That's, you get a bond in sports, because it's like going into battle. I mean, there's, you go into a place and everybody's against you except those other 12 guys. And uh, it, there's something about that that really made a lot of difference. We traveled together extensively. Now, I'd forgotten how much I enjoyed being across the hall from you in junior high. When I, a little time I was at the middle at the middle school, Dan was across the hall, and when our, both our doors were open, this is when I was with, with the special ed kids. I could hear him teaching history, and it was really 
a very animating experience. <laughs> you, you really bring history alive, and yeah. that's appreciated. So. Well, see, now that I'm, I'm much older and so forth, and I teach history, and, I just say it's just sort of my history. It doesn't matter because, you know, I, I, I have a little story for everything. And so. just, just for the record, I really appreciate these three guys, and Mr. Evans, too, coming, because we've, we've rescheduled this program three times. <laughs> so I am so glad that you guys uh, consented to come, because... Uh, you know, it's kind of embarrassing to ask people to do something and say, oh, no, no, we don't need you <laughs> next month, and then you do it again. So anyway, thanks a lot. That's quite all right. Yes, Bill. Bill Moore, it's your turn. When were you at Parsons? Um, I came in the fall of 67, uh, graduated in 71. Cello Huerta came down. Uh, he would come down through Florida. Uh, during, after signing day, which was the first Wednesday in February, and he would see, like, who wasn't signed and he used to be a coach at the university or he played at university of florida and he was a captain with my head coach bubba ware and uh so he'd come through and uh one third of the football players that played at parsons at that time there's about 100 of us so there's about 30 to 40 that played were from florida really oh yeah we had no problem going back down because uh there'd always be some junior or senior at the car and we just take off but getting back to how he recruited us so he cut he came and he there was like two or three of my, I was from Pompano Beach Senior High School. And um, you know, in the state of Florida, they have spring football. So it's a big thing to try and go get those kind of, especially when he was from Florida and he had all those contacts in Florida. So um, I was uh, recruited then and then I came up and at that time they also had freshman football. So they shaved our head balls and we walked around this little town. I mean, there I am 30 miles from Miami and here I am in a small town up in, <laughs> I mean, I never saw snow ever in my life until it was during uh, October of my freshman year. And I was walking at this stuff kind of going like this. And I'd never seen that before, you know. And the coach says, what are you doing? And I said, well, I've never seen this before, coach. <laughs> so, and my freshman coach was Dwayne Banks, who, you know, was a baseball coach up there at, uh, at the University of Iowa. And uh, they even named a field after him. And every other word he had was the F word. And uh, he was just a real fighter. It was. Uh, you know, just, just the way he was. I mean, when I, we were in high school, if somebody had a fight, you know, the coach would jump in and break it up. When we had a fight, he let them fight till they were finished and then made us all run hundreds and said, it's not really good for you guys getting fights. <laughs> 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 so, it was just, uh, my other coach that I had was Frank Falk, and he was my offensive line coach all the way through. Other coaches that were here at my time were uh, Tony Yelovich, who was the offensive line coach for Notre Dame University when they were the champions that uh, you know national champions um, Fox went on and played coached at Ohio State Oklahoma State and various places uh, I can't remember the defensive back coach but he was a coach for the St. Louis Cardinals down the road and um, we had we had terrific coaches and uh, Agostino was a real he played for Pittsburgh uh, Steelers and he was he had piranha in his office to give you an idea about him <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we, it's uh, we really it was a bunch of tough men I mean, that was, that's all there was to it. And so they, um, so when I was a freshman, we were, we had a freshman team. And so we were, we bared through that. And of course, no freshman team had lost a game in the four or five years since word had been there. So we went undefeated. And that was a good thing because I'd hate to find out what happened if we lost a game at night sometime. And then um, we went on and uh, when I was a sophomore, that's when the school started getting into trouble. And so they, they didn't give any scholarships out when I was a sophomore, so there's no freshman for us to pick on. And uh, we, when you came when you came to Parsons College, you traveled all over the, you know, we traveled. We I played in the Rose Bowl, in front of about three or four thousand people. I thought against L.A. State, I thought we were in a cavern. I mean, it was just it was empty and it, and, uh, but. Uh, Two weeks before, a week before, they had a rodeo there, so they're still like, pal, pal. <laughs> this is in the Rose Bowl, you know? And uh, since then, obviously, the universities have played there, but also played at Tampa Stadium. Uh, that's where the Bucks played until just a few years ago. Um, played at, uh, in the Quantico Marines, and uh, they had a team there, a lot, of, a lot of vets. I remember one time where a guy almost got in a fight, and then the guy dropped into a karate stance, and we said, what? Probably better walk back to the huddle, you know? <laughs> Because <laughs> so, these guys, and the, well, the linebacker, uh, he had played at the University of Wisconsin. The guy was basically in front of me for most of the game. And so that was in Washington, D.C. We played up in Mankato State in Minnesota, played at Tennessee State, which is an all-black school uh, at that time. And 
Joe Gilliam was the quarterback. Uh, he played for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, Two Tall Jones was the defensive lineman. He was a freshman when I was a senior, and he, of course, made fame in the, with the Dallas Cowboys. I mean, he was a tall, skinny guy. I remember the very first play of the game, we are going to do a little cross block and went right between his legs because he's so tall. He can't kill the fullback. The fullback gets back and Huddleston's. Did you even touch the guy? No. <laughs> so I was fortunate I started um, every year. I think uh, I was captain of the last football team Parsons ever had. It was um, myself and John Lanier and John Patrick. John Patrick was from uh, West Palm Beach, Florida, and John Lanier was from East St. Louis High. And he, that's pretty tough when you come from East St. Louis. And we were like, damn, we had players from all over. I still have a really good friend, Andy Ballish, that I see over in uh, Kentucky. And he was from Los Angeles. He played. He came in when I was a junior because they still didn't give any scholarships out and we were down to about 40 or 50 players and so they got some junior college guys to fit the need and then when I was a senior, um, then they you were allowed to play freshman that, that year and that's also the year they stopped giving laundry money out, what we used to call laundry money. Uh, we we got fifteen dollars a month. We had everything. Legal. Legal. It was legal. It was legal, right? And then that was the last year they didn't. And I think that was one of the biggest mistakes that the NCAA ever made because you hear these guys who get in trouble because they're poor. I mean, these guys are dirt poor. They have no money. They come from families of ten people. Uh, I remember McCoy came from. Uh, he's a D back from New Jersey. I mean, he was one of nine kids, and he didn't, he never got anything. He would just live for that fifteen dollars, you know. And he had a couple of good weeks, and then he'd have to do nothing except just eat. But I'm sure those guys nowadays have the same problem. That's why they get in trouble, mm -hmm. you know. But at that time, Dan and I were fortunate. We had room, board, tuition, and books and fees, and $15 a month for the had laundry money. So it was, it was great. Um, as far as the academics are concerned, uh, had I was a math major, had terrific professors, uh, just like Dan had alluded to. Um, we, uh, I had class sizes of 12 to 15 people. Uh, Dale Buchanan, uh, you know, West Point graduate, Colonel Hackett, West Point graduate. Uh, Dr. Tyman, uh, he was a, uh, I still get Christmas cards from him, he's doing great. Uh, we had uh, Vic Rail, how would I forget him? He was terrific, uh, probably one of the best professors I ever had. And um, he would have had a doctorate, but he went into geometry and the guy that he was underneath died. So he couldn't finish. So, I mean, he just didn't ever finish. That's why he wasn't a doctor. But these guys were terrific. And we would meet Sid Bradley and myself. He was a D-back, and he was from Pensacola, Florida. We'd meet, oh, at 7 o'clock in the morning with these guys. These guys are already up since 6. And we'd just talk math, do problems on the board, and whatever. It was just, it was a, I, I could say nothing bad about my education at Parsons College. It was just, it was terrific. And I, I was a history minor, so that's why I come I knew Dan always sat in front of class because I'd get there and there'd be brain up front. <laughs> I hope all my students are listening. <laughs> and all of us football players are back in the back. Of the, look at that guy, you know. But anyway, it was, uh, we were, uh, Dan and I both were gold key um, students or gold key winners at the end when everything was said and done. So it was, uh, it was a great education for myself. Uh, I, I have no regrets. It was, um, it was a long way from home, and um, when I was here, my mom died of cancer, and that was uh, that was probably the only tough thing about being from home. But she did see me play when we played Tampa, and then two months later, she passed away. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know it at the time, but my dad did, and then uh, after after I found out, then. But the um, the guys were great, the coaches were great, and uh, I had switching of coaches. Werder was our freshman coach, but I, Banks was the head freshman coach. And then I Kay remember, Wayne. I remember his daughter. Oh yeah. She was right. Well, you know, beautiful. It, right. And then Kay Wayne Williamson. Beautiful girl. Yeah. Kay Wayne Williamson was the next. He was coach for two years, and then Reed finished it up in 1970. And then Chettle came. I don't remember when that was. A day when in the 80s sometime. And um, he called me up and he said, "Look, I'm going to come up, you know, for something or other." And he came up. He had such a glorious time. And then he goes back home, and then he dies of a heart attack. 1985. Yeah, I mean, he just, he sat at the Elks Club. They shut the Elks Club down like at 1 or 2 in the morning or something like that. I mean, he just, you know, he shouldn't have done that because he had a heart condition anyway. But he was a wonderful person. And uh, you're right, his, his daughter was beautiful. Oh, and, uh, correcting. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, uh, but she called and she said, you know, the people of Fairfield just treated him like gold. You know, he had absolutely no regrets. Or she had no regrets that he had come up here because it was just such a heartwarming thing for him mm -hmm. to be back 
Because that was back when he was, until just recently, he was the only Babe Ruth team, but he had taken, Bubba was his son, who was also became a lawyer, uh, to the Nationals and Babe Ruth or something like that. I mean, so they had all those people, and then the, the football, like Stu Gomer showed up. Sure. And, I mean, it was just a great thing. So, yeah, we had quite the experience. I had quite the experience, and um, it was just like Dan said. It's, uh, it was probably a great setting for myself. Now, are you in the picture there in the pyro of the 69? Yeah, this is the, I was just looking at that and all these old guys. You know, guys everybody's got brown hair and still has hair, you know? So. <laughs> you still have hair. So anyway, yeah, that, uh, I was uh, over here somewhere, I think, right there. I, I was fortunate. Um, when I was a sophomore, I started uh, first game, then I didn't start a second, then I started a third, and Freddie Thiel and I were kind of fighting it out. And the only problem was all this, the guys that I played with were all seniors. So everything, every time something happened that was wrong, it was always my fault. <laughs> I was the center, and you know, it was, it was my fault. Max Stewart, you know, Bernie Martin, and those guys. It was, it was quite the experience. But uh, I have, yeah. It was. Um, we lost our first four games, and then we uh, won our last five, and and had a winning season. And uh, it was. It was, it was fun. And these guys, like uh, Dan said, were, they're from everywhere. Pennsylvania, New Jersey, California. Uh, O.B. Nelson, one quick one for you. Okay, I played with this, you know, Dick played the last two years. He played at the University of Kansas and he played with me. An O.B. story, okay. Um, he comes into the class one time and he says, somebody says, we ever got to have a quiz in here? And he goes, and he's a social study guy, you know. So he goes, uh, Next time you see me climb through that ladder, and it was on the second floor, come through that window and uh, off the ladder, we'll have a quiz in here. So the next day, he put a ladder up there and he climbs up the ladder, and comes through the window. And they had a quiz. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of character O.B. Nelson was. Actually, one time he was speaking at the Elks. And he began his address with the people of Fairfield are very generous people. And you give to worthy causes. And I'm going to pass this jar around and I would like you to make a donation to a worthy cause. And it went all around, it was full of money and went back, it got back in, he says, and the worthy cause was Obi Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was quite the character. So it was uh, and and his son was quite the character too. But <laughs> he was a great he was a great linebacker because he was crazy. He's the one that he well he shot his Shot a shot his a hole in his foot with a gun or something like that. Mm -hmm. So then Kansas, so he ruined his foot. Accident. Yeah, a hunting accident, yeah. and so he ruined his foot, and so Kansas gave up the scholarship on him. So he sat at home for a year and re. Then he finished his last two years at Parsons. Mm -hmm. So when his father died, they were talking about the funeral, and they told his mother. Now he says, you know, Dad can't sit still too long, so if he gets up, and walks out on his funeral. Don't be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Oh, yeah, thank you. This is great. They can turn off the camera. Well, I'll catch my breath here. That was pretty exciting. Uh, we're now uh, going to finish up with Dave Neff and Fred Flintspaugh. Uh, Fred was in the, uh, the pep band, and he's going to tell us a little bit about his days <laughs> playing what instrument? <laughs> well, I played the trumpet. Okay. And. Um, Parsons was a small college from about 1951 through 55, about 250 students, as I remember. And our band was equally small. It, it functioned as a pep band for the um, football games and basketball games. And um, from uh, during this uh, time, did I say 51 through 55? Mm -hmm. I couldn't remember. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, the uh, main thing that I remember about it was that the band would range anywhere from about 10 to 14 <laughs> members. So uh, it truly was just a pep band. No uniforms, nothing like that. That's you, about all I have. Did you like wear it. a tie and white shirt or anything to just No, whatever. not really. <laughs> okay, interesting. So what like, did you play for just for football or for basketball, football, everything? Football, basketball, just about anything. They had an athletic function we'd okay. play. Did you play for school dances? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. Could you have school dances? I know, I know back in the 20s they couldn't have dancing on campus, but when did that change? Oh, they had, they had um, homecoming dances and held, held them at the armory. Okay. And the uh, sororities and the fraternities had parties and dances. And that, uh, 
Jean, can you tell were there were they having dances when you were there? Yes, they did. So I, I don't know. But I know I know Lydia Montgomery told me one time that the attic of their home had been remodeled so they could have dances for the college students and because there were not they weren't the, allowed to have dances on campus. I'd go back to their attorneys. Yeah. Mm. So anything else you want to share, Fred? Uh, I think that's about it. Okay. All right. And Frankie, why don't you get one of those uniforms and show on camera? Because I don't think we actually saw that on camera. We have some examples of uh, uniforms, like from the, probably the 60s. I think there's an early basketball uniform, too, that I saw. The, yeah, the band uniform there. This would be like from the 60s. And there behind Frankie is the, the tall hat. And then this was Dick Grant. Dick Grant was killed in World War II. Okay. And his sister uh, gave us this. So so we have this too. That's Dick Grant's. And so, from so he was. So he was from. Pilaska. From and so he was from the late 30s, early 40s. 40s. From the 40s. 40s. So that was a uniform from the 40s. Mm -hmm. And the rose and green. It's still the old old rose and uh, the green, mm -hmm. where the wild rose meets the prairie. Okay. With the summer change. Now, when did they change those colors? Now, did you Anybody get, know? Uh, yeah, they, here's a warm-up. Is that a girl's? Is that a girl's uniform? Did you say, a warm-up suit? I don't know. There's a basketball uniform back there. It's very plain. This one, yeah, this one And that's a girl's girls' basketball. Is that from the 40s, Vera? Uh, yeah, yeah, late 40s. Late 40s. Okay. And then uh, Bill LaRue's yeah. uh, basketball and football. Yeah, this, those are Bill LaRue's letter jacket there. <laughs> Bill LaRue was, for those of you that don't know, was a character that frequented the square, almost always wore saddle shoes and uh, three or four watches and wore a Parsons College sweatshirt. Went to or high school and college. He went, went to all the athletic events. He was quite a character. And uh, kind of like the town, uh, almost like the town mascot. Big, a big uh, Parsons fan. In fact, in that 1969 yearbook, under the football, there's a picture of him. It doesn't say his name. It just says, our biggest fan. Oh. Mm -hmm. And he's actually wearing uh, the sweater that Frankie just held up. You have a mark. Yeah, and I don't know if it's big enough to show up on camera or not. Maybe Susan. Yeah, right on your, your right page there. Yeah, right, right there. We'll get the camera to zoom in on that. Can you see that? She got it. Yeah, Bill LaRue is quite a character. I mean, I always loved his his bicycles. He had he had two bicycles. He had his regular bicycle that had the streamers and you know the big flag and everything. And then he had his Sunday bike, which Terry Klein of Oakwood Nursery now owns. And it, it's the one with the steering wheel with the Mickey Mouse license plate and, oh my, all the decals and stickers on it. What a hoot. Oh, that's right. In the 1969 Homecoming Queen, we may as well just, while we're, while we're on that. We marked a whole bunch of stuff and we didn't know if we'd get to it or not. Who was the Homecoming Queen? Suzanne somebody. Patterson? Suzanne Patterson. And what sorority was she from? I think Delta Zeta. Delta Zeta, that's right. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. It's one of Sally's sororities. Okay, all right. Thank you. Okay. In fact, while you're on that, the, some of those sorority sisters still get together. Uh, our, our friend uh, George Jordan III has okay. email that comes sure. out, and he sent a, an email picture of a lot of these same ladies that got together during this last year down in Florida, and we had to guess who they were, and then a week later he sent the names out to see if you could match them up. And they, they still, uh, still look very, very attractive at their, well preserved at, at our age. That's okay. good. <laughs> That's good. Well, this is Dave Neff. And you know, I don't think I introduced Ed, I just said Mr. Aarons, Ed Aarons, Ed right? Aarons, yep. Okay. Yep. Didn't he used to have the candy? He was, the, can he was okay. the candy man. He kept every all the sweet tooth I and all was, the Denison business in Fairfield. I was so <laughs> jealous of his daughters when he, when I was little because I thought, boy, that'd be neat to have a dad that had a candy truck. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so Dave, what's, what's your connection with Parsons? I was uh, a student at Parsons for four years, very young, was one of my professors. Tib was uh, my counselor for the first couple years. Uh, John War, Harry Burris, there was a, a lot of folks in the athletic department that encouraged me to mm -hmm. keep going. Paul Sells was 
first uh, professor that I really got to know because after the first day he called me by name. I knew I better pay attention in class. He knew all of his students' names and not that many other. It took a couple, three weeks, but everybody else knew who you were, but after the second day, Professor Sells would call you by name and you knew oh you better, better be there. Um, I was a student for four years and graduated. I had a little bit of background working at swimming pools and in the Cleveland area, carpetbagger like Dan. I was from the east side of Cleveland, he was from the west side of Cleveland. And when Parsons still had a swimming pool at the trustee gym and they wanted to get somebody, one of our senior physical education majors to, uh, to manage that pool. And so I was the only one of the group that applied that, that had that in the background. And uh, as it was, I was accepted. And that summer of 1969, when I graduated, the pool was losing about uh, 3,000 gallons of water a day, and so they shut it down. So I never got a chance to manage it, but I was, I was hired to come back and be intramural director. So I was uh, intramural director for a, uh, the first year, and then another uh, one of our students, Biff Coomer, who went on to become a professor at the uh, University of Iowa and Western Kentucky University. He took a, took a year off during that time, and then he, uh, he came back, and they evidently liked what I was doing. They created a job as director of basic skills physical education, and so I did that for three years, and I picked up the sports information director's job. I coached track and cross country. Uh, I was the tennis chauffeur for Harry Burris. I drove his team around from here to St. Louis and other places, and uh, anyway, it was, a, it was a great eight years, I'll have to say. I had a chance to meet my, my bride as a, as a student out there. She's, we're the same age, basically, but uh, she was a first aid student, and we uh, have, uh, come April, will be 30 years that we've been together, so it's hard to believe. Uh, some of the, uh, the things that I'd like to reminisce on, you, you've mentioned O.B. Nelson two or three times. Uh, I was asked uh, at one of the reunions, uh, 1988 reunion, to do a, a reminiscence uh, remembering O.B. Nelson, and I was able to work with Dean Gabbert, and then we connected with a lot of the other people who had uh, had O.B. as a coach, as a, uh, as a colleague, and we've got uh, 33, 34 pages of pictures, of remembrances, of other things, of, of what he had done, and everybody's related to the story, so I'll, I'll pick but one. Uh, when the uh, war was breaking out, and this must have been probably the Korean War, I guess, uh, when these, uh, these folks were getting ready to go into the service, and, and uh, OB was a Zeta, uh, which you got right up back behind her, Zeta Theta Gamma, and some of the fellows were coming back from, uh, from supper, over at the Commons, and OB was, would go part way up the stairway and get on top of the piano, and then he'd jump off, and then he'd go around again and up to the top and jump off again, and they were asking him what he was doing. He says, well, I understand if you've got fallen arches, they won't get you in the service, so I'm trying to make my arches fall down. So, so that was his, his outlet from there. But uh, there's, if you don't have, if you haven't had one of these, or you'd like to see one, one has been no, donated to, in fact, why don't you just keep both of them okay, if you want, great. that way people, more people can see them. But it's uh, a lot of fun stories. I think another one was uh, while he was trying to protest to the, uh, the administration about the leaking field house uh, roof, because sometimes in March and, and you'd have a little bit of a rainstorm and water would drip through, and so one night he decided the only way to protest it was to wear a slicker and carry an umbrella and put a bucket out <laughs> underneath there. So he sat on the bench coaching the team with a slicker and the umbrella and everything else, and he caught their attention, and the next year they, they finally got to work on, the, uh, on that. I'd say probably the, the biggest joy for me at Parsons was coming from, once again, a large community as, as I grew up in Cleveland to a, a small community. Uh, my first, second day that I was here, I was walking in town in order to get some tennis balls. I thought, I don't have that much space to bring things from Cleveland, but I could bring my racket, but I'm sure I can buy tennis balls in Fairfield. And, and uh, coming in town, there was a gentleman that pulled over to the side of the road and said, would you, uh, would you like to have a ride? And this was just about at the, the Burlington Northern Bridge there on 2nd Street. And I thought, well, why is he asking me if I want a ride to come into town? And so he says, well, I'll just, you know, just give you a lift. That's fine. And, Talk to him about it. He says, well, yeah, go to Gobbles Clothiers. He says, they, they got sporting goods. They got everything else there. That's the place to get your tennis balls. And from that point on, I just found that Fairfield was just a great, friendly community, warm people, and, and a real, uh, real great place to, to stay and, and have my career. Uh, as it was, Parsons was, um, was good to me with a four-year opportunity to, to do the coaching and things. As Bill Moore related, we, uh, we had the, the football team playing against the uh, 
the folks from Lincoln University, Jefferson Street, Joe Gillum. We <coughs> played that game at Bush Stadium in St. Louis, and that was probably one of the highlights for me. We had a chance to uh, fly down two weeks ahead of time, uh, first part of November. In fact, it was November 9th, as I recall. And uh, we flew down in the college plane, did a press conference with all these people, and turned around and flew back. And then a week later, we take off and go down and play in Bush Stadium. And as sports information director, we try to do as good a statistics as we could, and we would, uh, we would type a play by play on a, a ditto. This is before copiers were real prevalent, but you'd have a spirit master. And so we carried the typewriter and the ditto machine and all these oh, other man. things up to the press box in the third floor of Bush Stadium. And we were cranking out statistics, and the people from Lincoln University had never seen anything like that before. So we, right. we, we, we made a good impression on, on edge, them huh? from there. We were, we were having fun That's with it. That's great. Uh, I think, I think some of the other things, uh, as Dan mentioned, as far as basketball, they were ranked in the top 20 in the country. I think we got them up to number 12 for two weeks in a row during that time of their, their basketball career. My running career was, uh, was somewhat limited. I found that after having some very good coaches in high school, we were uh, sort of relegated to the uh, assistant football coaches who were more interested in football. They say, well, we'll drive you. You guys work out, and then we'll take you someplace this next weekend. And so we didn't get the real close coaching that maybe we, we could have had. But uh, the year before I came in, uh, in 65, uh, Lou Lincoln retired, and so all of his pictures were mm -hmm. in there before that. So talk about a span from all the way back to the gentleman that spoke earlier to where I arrived in the mid-60s really? to, to have okay. that, that opportunity. But uh, Lou was quite a, uh, quite a number of generations that he was able to share with on there. But uh, Parsons provided a lot of opportunity for, for people that wanted an education, as was related from all of our, our student athletes across the, the board here. We, uh, we had the opportunity, if we wanted to learn, the professors were accessible. It was, a, it was just a unique situation that was maybe two or three decades ahead of its time. And uh, a lot of people now realize that the benefit mm -hmm. of the personal attention sure. that, that we received. That, uh, when we graduated in 65, if you went to Bowling Green or Ohio State uh, in, in Ohio, they would look around and say, two out of the three of you won't be here because we don't have space for you sophomores. And so it, uh, a lot of folks took advantage of it. I took advantage of it before somebody else told me to go there. So I, <laughs> I, I started out with Parsons and finished and, and had, a, had a wonderful time with it. Good, good. Well, we're glad you stayed, Dave. Thank you. <laughs> You're, you've been an asset to this community and a good friend. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Well, I think we've just just about finished that up for today. Um, we had a couple other people that wanted to be here but couldn't be, so maybe we'll do a, a sequel with some of the mementos they had to share. But this is Mark Schaefer uh, at the Carnegie Museum, March 10th, 2002. Wishing you viewers of uh, FPAC a good life and a, I don't know, a nice day, I guess. <laughs>